okay. So uh, we can go ahead, Claire. Uh, so, hey, everyone, it's Jack. Uh, and I would invite us all right now to hit our chat buttons. And we're trying to just sort of get um, a biweekly take on what life looks like around the country um, as it relates to dining out and COVID. So if you hit chat, um, make sure you select either everyone or all panelists and attendees and just let us know, what are you seeing in your area? Are you seeing more people going out to eat? Are you seeing tons of masks in restaurants still? Have those masks come off? Are you seeing, um, you know, vaccination carding uh, at places? And make sure you include also where you're coming in from so we have the context of what part of the country you're representing. Um, so with that, let's uh, go forward. Uh, we do want to just quickly do our uh, bi-weekly update on the Patrick Carroll situation. And uh, as you see in chat, we're seeing, you know, probably there's still a few Patrick Carrolls out there. If you go one slide forward. So for those of you that aren't familiar with this, uh, we have an issue where many of you have been mislabeled Patrick Carroll. Like your identities have basically been scrubbed from Zoom, at least as far as this webinar goes. And it thinks that you're this person named Patrick Carroll. And the numbers that you see here are the percentage of folks that are labeled Patrick Carroll um, each time we do this webinar. Uh, so back in August, 61% of our attendees were mislabeled as Patrick Carroll and their identities were gone. Uh, we've had a nice drop off between August 5th and August 18th. And then it sort of tickled, uh, trickled down a little bit. We don't know what the number is gonna be today. I'm guessing it's gonna be slightly above 20%, but lower than the 23 we saw last time. But I think we're in like the phase of this where it's slowly just going to work its way down, hopefully into the teens and then sub 10% at some point. So I think many of you are already doing uh, and anticipating our very next request, if you go forward, Claire, which is help us inoculate everyone against the Patrick Carroll virus by doing exactly what you see everyone else doing. Please type your full name in a chat right now if you haven't already done so and just hit enter. Um, and if you do it to everyone, that'll help us see who you are. And if you show up as Patrick Carroll, we'll know to reach out and send you instructions on how to fix yourself, basically. So let's give that another 30 seconds and just keep going. If you haven't done it yet, just type your name in the chat, hit enter. And, uh, and I guess, Claire, we could just keep going forward. Okay, so uh, we have a few updates in our Report Pro platform. So if you're not familiar with the Report Pro, this is basically the one place you can go in the Data Central universe that has access to pretty much all of our reports. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet that's available to you to just you know access, download uh, over a thousand different reports with um, several new ones added every single week. If you haven't signed up for a package yet, um, you and your company should totally do it. It is just a, a great resource. And I wanted to call attention to Three in particular that we think are really interesting that have just recently been added. The first, if we go to the next slide, is our mid-year trend report. Many of you have um, been using this already for your you know, innovation planning. It's great. It's uh, over 100 pages of just everything that's happening with trends. We've talked about this before. It's a really, really fantastic piece of work, and it's there for you in Report Pro. Uh, the next is we just did a uh, report on climate change and sustainability. We're gonna talk about that a little bit today as well. This is a, a big topic for food that we think is only gonna get bigger over time. And this is part of our five in focus series, which is meant to be really quick um, pieces of content where you know these are the five things you have to know about a particular topic. And you'll find many of these reports inside Report Pro. And then finally, another one we wanted to call out is um, a great new trend watch edition that talks about seasonings and herbs and what's happening with um, you know, different flavors from around the world and how they're impacting cuisine here in the US. So we invite you to check that one out too. Uh, so with that, Claire, if we can go one step forward, uh, just as a reminder, there's a ton of stuff in Report Pro. Uh, we think it's unbelievably useful and it's all there for you, right? Uh, hundreds of recent reports uh, in totally digestible format. And they're also presentation ready. If you have to go in and do an internal presentation or something for customers, you'll have PowerPoint ready slides um, at your fingertips. Uh, and if we go uh, forward one more time, Claire, 
Uh, if anyone is interested, I'll leave this up for just 30 seconds. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about uh, Report Pro, uh, you can just hit yes to this and uh, we'll send you some info. Uh, if not, just say no and, uh, and we won't. And we'll leave that up for a second. Um, so Jared, Claire, um, while we leave this up for the next 20 seconds, uh, what are some of the more interesting things you've been working on in terms of reporting? What's, the, what's your next big one after the food values study, Jared? It's going to be on global flavors, and that one will be coming out in the next few weeks. And it's really interesting. It's basically all global cuisines beyond mainstream uh, Italian, Chinese, and Mexican. So basically, like, really cool deep dives on how all different types of consumers are eating just global cuisines around the, uh, the globe, and then the operator approach to menuing those things as well. Fantastic. Claire? Um, yeah, I'm doing kids menus this week. Uh, so mega trends of what's actually interesting happening on kids menus and then uh, a dipping sauce, kind of signature sauce inspiration report that I'm excited If you had to say yes or no, would you say that kids menus have gotten much better over the last five years or are they, um, <sighs> You know, let's uh, say it's kind of a weird is. time frame. I feel like they had a moment where they were getting better, and then things uh, kind of hit a hit a point where they're going back to being less exciting. Though I think we have a moment. It's in our mid-year trend report. It was an area of growth over the past year um, because people were adding them to the to-go menus. So I'm I'm hopeful. Got it. Well, with that, let's get started. Uh, Claire, if we can go for one more time. Uh, what does getting better mean? So uh, I'll just summarize. For a long time, kids' menus have been dominated by just a handful of familiar favorites. And if you actually ask parents what they care most about with kids' menus, where they most want to see improvement, normally you would expect people to say, I want something more affordable. That tends to be the number one answer across food applications, food categories. But kids' menus are unique in that the number one parent request is for greater variety. And we've been advocates for a long time of just bringing greater variety onto the kids' menu beyond the traditional cheeseburgers, pizza, you know, mac and cheese, spaghetti, grilled cheese sandwich and nuggets um, sort of a thing. So uh, I think, Claire, you're right. We, we definitely saw some upticks in more interesting activity, but uh, hopefully we'll continue seeing that going forward. Uh, okay, so as a, as a setup, um, we have said for a while that consumers make food decisions based on a number of things, taste, convenience, affordability, familiarity uh, with an item, and more and more, and this is still relatively new, but becoming much more important, uh, personal values are becoming a part of that decision-making process around what to eat, where to get it from, what to, what to order, et cetera. And personal values means many, many different things, right? It's sort of aligning what you believe in and who you see yourself as, as an individual, and making food choices that are consistent with that. And I feel like personal values have extended into many other domains of life too. Uh, and at the most extreme ends, we've uh, managed in, at least in this country, and I think around the world for the, for in many cases to politicize a whole lot of different things. Uh, if we can go forward, uh, Claire. So, I mean, we've managed to politicize things like shoes. And if we go forward again, We've managed to politicize, we've managed to politicize a pillow, which is sort of an amazing thing uh, to do. And, you know, we've also sort of seen this in the world of food as well, if we go forward. And there have been some brands where the values behind that brand are fundamentally intrinsic to what that brand is all about, right? And they've sort of declared permission to, to message around that, um, whether it's uh, Ben and Jerry's and the work they've done over the years or you know, maybe on the opposite end of the political spectrum, something like Black Rifle Coffee Company, which has a, a different set of values and, and missions. And uh, we don't wanna dwell on just the stuff that's supercharged and political, but look at the broader world of personal values beyond just these sort of, you know, really sort of um, high intensity examples. And with that, Claire, um, I think we can summarize this as we used to sort of say, hey, you are what you eat. More and more now we're seeing people make that internal declaration of, you know, you eat what you are. You, you, you're making choices that are consistent with your own view of yourself as an individual. It's not just about taste. It's not just about affordability. It's not just about 
convenience anymore, but we're selecting brands and restaurants and food items and menu choices and whatnot that have values that are consistent with who we would like to be as people. Uh, so we can go forward, Claire. Uh, so Jared's gonna share some information um, from our new food values keynote. This is a deep dive report that you'll find in Report Pro about the values that matter to consumers, how they are aligning those values with their food choices, and, uh, and what we should be thinking about as either suppliers to the food industry or as operators or as food retailers. Uh, so we can go forward, Claire, one, yeah, once again. Um, Jared, do you want to maybe kick us off? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, so this was our last keynote we released and it, it was a pretty interesting one because it's, you know, it's not a deep dive on a specific type of food, but instead, you know, kind of like a look at what motivates consumers. And, you know, the, right off the bat, the, the main thing we found is that values are very important to consumers, you know, not only in terms of their identity, but even in affecting like their food choices and what they choose to eat. And, um, you know, another cool thing that we'll see on the next slide too is that there's a ton of different variation around that too. I mean, we just saw the different food brands, you know, that would appeal to different types of consumers, but there's also a lot of variation in what affects our values. And here we see kind of a list of a bunch of different influences on values and how those have changed over time. And, you know, especially taking coronavirus into account, we can see some of the more personal, you know, family personal experience type values became more important in this time frame. Um, but some of the more artificial uh, sources here, like MSM, social media, celebrities, they became less important to some, some consumers in that time frame over the last two years. Um, but then again, across the board, actually all of these in one way or another became more important um, in the last two years too. I think, Jared, this is probably because we have a heightened sense of what values mean to us today, because values used to be something I think a lot of us would like just internalize. And now it feels like um, we're trying to externalize that in both private and public choices that we're making. So maybe, you know, either, whether the values we hold are the same or have changed, the fact that we're engaging in more things where we're signaling our value or making conscious choices that are consistent with our values makes it seem uh, just more important across the board and all these influences being more important. Uh, th there was a question in chat, and I think the, around what age group this represents. This is a general population that's reflective of, you know, the U.S. Census, essentially. So across all age groups, across all demographics, across all regions of the country, and we will look at some demographic cuts uh, as well. Uh, Claire, if you could take us forward. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Um, but yeah, and if you Claire, if you don't mind clicking again. Uh, just like you were saying, Jack, so that last slide was just total gen pop, but here we see an interesting generational breakdown. And on this slide, we ask consumers, how have your values changed over time? And we can see that younger consumers in particular, Gen Z and millennials, they're very more open to having their values change. You know, they're younger, they're still finding their place in the world, whereas boomers kind of at a higher rate are more set in their ways, um, claiming that their values are more constant and unwavering. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to use this as a chance to just get a read from all of us. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons for companies, food brands, restaurants, taking a, a stand on public issues and signaling their values, not just on general things, but on, you know, let's say very specific things that might even be supercharged in some way. Do you all think that that is a good idea or is it just way too treacherous to do? Um, so let's see what you think and then we'll see what consumers think. Should food brands and restaurants take a stand on public issues uh, without trying to bias the results? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think you will. Um, well, Claire, Jared, what do you think? Uh, how do you think people are voting in this case? Do you think they're voting bad idea or a good idea? I think that it's going to be slightly more a good idea, but I think it'll be close. Yeah, we can't see it, but I think it would depend on your role at a company. Um, like if you're higher up and your decisions impact like all of your employees, whereas I think from like a regular employee standpoint, we all think, yes, make a, make a stance, take a stance, but it has so many implications. Oh, you feel like if 
you're in a more senior position, you might perceive the liability more. I, I do. I mean, we obviously can't cut it that way, but I think there's bigger risks the higher up, obviously, that you are, whereas I think most people want to say, yes, of course you should take a stance, but there's so many implications to that. That's a good point. So let's see um, how we voted. Uh, we've been active for about a minute, so I'm going to end the poll right now. And so I actually found oh, this wow. a, little, a little surprising. People are more likely to say bad idea than good idea. And they might very well be right. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we do know that consumers think it's more and more important for companies to have values that are consistent with their own, but it's also potentially treacherous if you step on the wrong landmine or don't step exactly the right way. Um, so we, wait, we want uh, substantially more bad than good in our voting. Let's see what consumers actually say. And, so, you know, this... Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. No, no go, go ahead, Jared. This is another, you know, interesting one that like calls back to the slides we've looked at. It's the younger consumers definitely that are more gung-ho for this type of thing, uh, especially Gen Z. Um, you know, almost three quarters think it's a good idea, which is incredible. Yeah, so either we have, you know, a disproportionate number of boomers uh, attending. I actually don't think that's, <laughs> that, that's the case. Um, or we just see things differently and we perceive liability, right, in a way that consumer wouldn't. I mean, look at the numbers here. We said more bad than good, but consumers with every group, um, with the potential exception of boomers, are way more likely to say good idea than bad idea. Um, so again, uh, consumers want this, but boy, could you screw something up if you don't do it the right way. And I think what some of what you learn in the, the deeper dive in the new food values keynote, if you um, choose to open that up in Report Pro, are some of the tips that you might want to consider to, to not step on those landmines. Uh, if we, it's funny, Claire, I just tried to click my screen to make the slide go forward and I realized I can't do that. You have to. No, so, no you, can, you can take it back if you want, but I'll try to keep up. <laughs> no, so well, I wonder if we can take a look at the operator's perspective uh, mm -hmm. on this topic. Uh, Jared? Yes, so just like we saw with consumers um, on the first slide, values are very important to operators too. And you know, for the vast majority of them, they claim that their their own personal values influence how they run their businesses. And I think you know, many of us have worked in restaurants. You have to be empathetic to do it. I mean, customers can be ridiculous sometimes, um, and you also have your employees to take care of. So values are very important on the operator side as well. Yeah, ninety two percent. Claire, if we could. And, you know, especially, again, taking coronavirus into account, many, many operators say that their personal values have become more important than they were two years ago. And they even see that trend continuing into the future that, you know, their values are just going to become more of a component of how they run their businesses. Yeah. And the thing I would say is you'll, you'll note that um, the numbers don't add up perfectly to 100 percent because I think there was probably a response choice that said they've become less important. And that number is small. It's almost rounding error small. So That's what correct. you want to look at here is not that more people said no change. You want to look at the fact that a third said that values as to operators have become a bigger part of their business decisions, right? Who they buy from, the products they source, et cetera, versus a, a minuscule percentage, like 2% or so, or 5% that said that values become less important over the past couple of years. And, you know, this even, so this even uh, trickles down to how operators purchase. So if their suppliers, their distributors and manufacturers were to engage in value-based initiatives, the vast majority would either be indifferent or actually more likely to purchase from those companies that do engage in those types of initiatives. Yeah. Um, um, so it's important to note, it, it goes through the entire supply chain, right? It's not just, you know, operators are consumers too. And they would like to be able to trickle down some of the stuff they buy and that messaging to their ultimate customer as well. And you make a good point here too, Jared, about the desire for product information from suppliers, as well as better access to products that align with their values. Any commentary here? Yeah, definitely. I, I think that, you know, we asked like a bunch of different options, what operators want as it relates to values. And really it came down to things that they feel good serving, um, you know, that they can tell a story about and that just, you know, aligns with their personal values. 
Um, but you know, here, this one asks a good question. Is there anything that consumers and operators both want? Do they intersect on anything? And uh, it actually just boils down to one word, um, which is community. Um, you know, and definitely taking the coronavirus into account, communities become super important. Um, and, you know, the stat on this slide is interesting. We asked operators, if you were to take a stance on a public or on a key issue in your business, what do you see as the top benefit for that? And half of them said that creating that sense of community would be the top benefit that would come out of that. And, you know, this really makes sense. I mean, restaurants are interwoven with the fabric of our communities. When a restaurant that's been in business in our hometown goes out of business, um, you know, everyone talks about it because it is a part of the community. And, you know, we see some good examples of that on the next slide, but, uh, <laughs> Coronavirus was hard for many restaurants. And, you know, we heard countless cases of restaurants helping their local community, or more likely the local community helping restaurants during this time frame. Yeah. And look, uh, the whole domain of personal values does not have to be divisive or politically charged or anything like that. Values covers just about everything. Now, some will grab headlines, certainly more than others, but those are probably also the ones that are more likely to be landmines as mm -hmm. well but there are some things that you know probably the vast majority of uh, operators consumers and americans would agree on as being positives that we could all do as well um and you know the reason all this is so important is that you know loneliness depression anxiety there are almost other public health crises going on right now um we ask consumers you know a bunch of different things and many of them said that they feel a sense of feel a need for community and they also feel lonely. So um, this is important to keep in mind because food is a cultural medium that's shared between people and it can create that sense of community. So for those of you um, that are willing to share something a little personal in chat, if I could just ask you to chat, have you felt more lonely personally over the last year? I mean, this is probably a decent you know, sample of people across many different age ranges and across the country. Uh, I think I have, right? I mean, part of me says no, because I actually see more faces these days via video chat than I used to, but it's not totally real, right? I mean, you think of all the people that you've met via Zoom or something, and you finally meet them in person, and you think your brain goes, oh, that's what you really look like in person. There's really never a time when you've met someone in person, and then finally see them on Zoom and say, oh, that's what you look like in two dimensions, right? <laughs> There's no new information conveyed over there. Uh, are we getting mostly no's on the on the loneliness thing, or what are you it's saying? Like half and half, I feel like. Half and half. Okay, we're going to have to further analyze that. I wonder if the people who designated Patrick Carroll are more likely to vote one way or the other. <laughs> um, let's keep going, Claire, if we could. Now, this is an interesting one. So we're, we're going to get into the specific issues here, but here we ask consumers, and this is a Gen Pop uh, sample. What specific key issues should restaurants and food brands tackle? And hunger and food insecurity uh, definitely rose to the top of the list. And that makes sense because, you know, restaurants, food brands do serve food. So it does seem appropriate here. But actually, we'll see on the next slide. Um, yeah. You know, it's not one size fits all. It's not. And look, the key is not just that there's only, you know, one thing that's high up at the top. It's there's a pretty wide variety of issues. And if someone said, hey, you have to just pick one, it would be sort of hard to do. So I think there are two points here, Jared, right? One that hunger and food insecurity are things that consumers you know, most align with what food brands and restaurants should do because it is just very you know, relevant to what those types of companies are about. But it's not just that, right? There's a whole bunch of things here and it changes based on the type of consumer as well, and we're just looking at age breaks or sort of generational breaks over here. But if you cut this by gender or income level, or in some cases, the area of the country, you'll see variations too. So there really is not a one size fits all thing. But I think we do wanna think, do things that, that feel utterly authentic to the brand or the company. And that oftentimes consumers will be able to see through it if it doesn't feel authentic. That's absolutely right. And um, I think that, you know, just one takeaway here is that 
you know, as we're all on food and, uh, or next slide, Claire, if you don't, Claire, if you don't mind, um, as we all are in the food industry, it's important to have these two things on your radar um, as they're pictured on this radar here on this slide. <laughs> Hunger and food security, yep. Let's keep going. And, um, you know, on the operator side of things, you know, many operators are engaged with these issues. We see on the right that more than a third actually do plan on tackling these types of issues in the future and that half of them would be more likely to purchase from their suppliers if they knew they were tackling initiatives like this as well. Yeah, and then we, we have over 40% of operators saying they plan to do something to help with the issue of hunger and insecurity as well. So it's... Now, now here's um, you know an interesting one. So here we ask consumers, if a restaurant that you visited did the following, would you be more likely to dine there, or less likely, or would it not make a difference? And you know, initially, right across the board, all of these have more people attracted to the idea than um, you know opposed to it. But again, at the top of our list here, it really comes down to the food insecurity issues, um, and those actually be like you know some of the patriotic ones out too, like uh, offering veterans meals and highlighting local USA made things. It's just almost like a solid winning proposition for most people. Um, very few detractors on those issues. Yeah, for each one of those, you're gonna gain 10 times more people than you would lose in the process. And, uh, you know, they're not necessarily no brainers, but they're pretty close to it if you can do it and message it the right way. I would say again, you got to find a way to do it authentically. It can't just be a bullet point um, on a, on packaging or in an advertisement somewhere. People do end up seeing through that, and I think we're at a point where we can't take sort of that that generic approach to signaling uh, a personal value or a corporate value of some sort. You have to actually sort of demonstrate and show that you really mean it in some way, where consumers will just sort of gloss over it because every company is doing it in like a basic way. It's the really sort of more deliberate and advanced ways that companies do things that consumers really take notice of. Uh, go forward, Claire. So I actually wanted to go back to this chart that we showed previously where we'd highlighted uh, hunger and food insecurity as something that consumers said, yeah, you should, you know, food brands and restaurants should take a stand here. And I actually wanted to highlight something a little bit further down the list, but still, you know, not, not too far from the top which is around climate change. And the reason for this call out is not because 30% is you know, better than 34 or 35 or 49% or that it's much better than 17%. It's just that we know looking at many of the other studies that we've done that this looks like a number that we think is gonna continue increasing in the periods ahead. And you could probably say that of many of the numbers here, but if we had to pick one topic that feels like it's hot button and you're gonna see you know, increasing conversation around. We've been saying this for three or four years at this point. It really is uh, climate change where, you know, terms like climate crisis are now being used to describe the same thing. And I want to, you know, uh, sort of offer a disclaimer here where, you know, as a company, Data Central, we don't have a particular position on the issue itself. We're not saying that we think that climate change is good or good or bad, or that it's, you know, uh, anthropic or it's not. Uh, we are saying, though, that based on the data that we've seen uh, and that we've been tracking, that this looks like a thing that's going to continue to increase in importance and relevance to consumers, and specifically in how they make food decisions. Um, as we've seen, you know, the topic of climate change is, is going to leap from associations with fossil fuels to things like associations with the food industry more specifically. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk uh, about this and what we think that means. So Claire, if we could maybe just click forward one more time. You know, it's why you start seeing headlines like this, right? Or opinion pieces. Hey, when deciding what foods to eat for lunch, you should consider the impact of climate change, right? These aren't things that we would have seen like a decade ago, but you're gonna see more and more of this sort of thinking from consumers and industry advocates and whatnot and it will be fairly prevalent, we think, in the periods ahead. And as food companies and food restaurants and food suppliers 
we should think about what that's going to mean for us and how we approach product development and sourcing and menus um, and more. Uh, so we can keep going. So, you know, here's a here's an interesting quote that we think is uh, uh, fairly relevant. The main way that most people will experience climate change is through its impact on food, what they eat, how it's grown, the price they pay for it, and the availability and choices that they have around food. And uh, this may very well play out. Claire, if we could go forward. Uh, and you see, you know, brands um, that have said, you know, we're not just going to say we're sustainable or doing something, you know, that's generally good or that we have a LEED certified building or, or something like that. Um, there, there are brands now emerging in the food and beverage space that basically said, you know, climate is at the core of what we do. Uh, <laughs> um, so here, here's one brand that, you know, look, I have no idea if tea from a bamboo tastes any better than tea from something else. I, I wouldn't have thought so. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But the idea is that um, bamboo is a much more sustainable crop, that it requires much less water uh, to, to grow and to, to farm. And that as a result, the product is better for the climate in the end if you're drinking tea made from bamboo. But that is fundamental to what they are, right? It's not a bullet point added to some piece of advertising. It is foundational to the brand. I think there's another example that we have, Claire. Uh, and again, these are just um, examples uh, among, you know, dozens if not hundreds that are emerging. Here, you know, look, I, I have no idea of this thing that I think is probably some sort of a pudding or yogurt type of a thing, but it's made from uh, purple potatoes instead. Would I have thought that I wanted to have that? I don't know. Maybe it tastes better. I don't know. But that's not the primary reason that it exists or why people would engage with it, right? The, the core promise here is that um, this crop requires, again, less water to produce. And as a result, you're having a more responsible product that also has a lot of superfood properties for you as well. Um, and I think there's a, there's a really good call out there, right, in, in chat that it's interesting that uh, both the examples we showed here don't specifically only talk about the climate, the climate claim. I think they do understand that it would be hard for people to make a choice with um, climate or personal value as the sole thing that you would consider. Like this thing tastes like crap, but it's good for the world. Like that's not gonna sell. So you have to talk about some of the other things, you know, taste delicious. It, you know, gives you superpowers or something, but that doesn't mean that the climate claim and the sustainability claim isn't very deliberate uh, and central to the brand. It's right, it's not something that they just sort of tack on later. It's foundational to why some of these products exist. Uh, Claire, if we can go on. Uh, and we're seeing this um, with, uh, with the restaurant industry too, right? So Panera has their cool food meals, their low carbon footprint meals where you can actually identify um, which menu options exist, uh, you know, uh, meet the criteria for having a low carbon footprint and are better for the climate overall. And if you go to the website, you can learn all about what the initiative actually means and how um, you can make more climate responsible choices as a consumer. Uh, and the nice thing about this is, you know, in the past, when you were asked to like, let's say pick something healthy to eat uh, back in like the eighties and nineties, you're often trading off taste for something like health. Here you could do something that is good for the world, uh, but also it's gonna taste great too, right? You're not really being forced to make a trade off. Uh, if we can go uh, one more for Claire, um, you know, Chipotle, uh, I think last year launched their real food print where you could actually look at detailed statistics in the app about the climate impact of the different menu items you may choose. Um, and they do in a way that actually shows you sort of like, you know, real world uh, implications, you know, soil health improvement, how much water is being um, saved or conserved um, from that one choice. So really trying to help you connect the dots between what you're choosing to eat and what you are doing to, to better the world. Uh, we can go one more time. Uh, and I just want to note, uh, we've had her on before. Eve Thoreau Paul um, is, part of the, is part of the leadership team at the Food for Climate League. Uh, we've partnered with them to, to do research 
to basically um, help under help you know manufacturers and and the food industry as a whole understand uh, how to get sort of a more positive climate message out there. Uh, and what I like about this organization is that they not take they take the stance of not trying to demonize anyone or anything, but say, hey, let's focus on the things that consumers love, you know, taste and flavor and all these things, and show them how you can do um, climate forward messaging and make climate forward uh, decisions, but still leading with the things that people care most about in food, like taste and flavor, without demonizing uh, companies or brands. So if you haven't checked them out, uh, we'd recommend doing a little work and, and Googling Food for Climate League. Uh, it's a great organization. Uh, we've decided to get involved. Uh, you and your companies may want to as well. Uh, can we go forward, Claire. So uh, that was probably the weirdest transition because we're going from uh, climate friendly, nice, clean, white background to this thing. Uh, what is this and why are we looking at it? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of comments in the chat that relate to this. So there's all sorts of challenges, of course, for a restaurant. We say we want climate friendly food, but we don't actually necessarily act upon that when we're in a restaurant. Maybe that's what we prefer to think we're doing at home or we have our own gardens and that reconciles what we actually want when we go to a restaurant. Uh, and for many years, it was uh, something this extreme. And to a certain consumer, it is still this extreme. This fine example is a current example, though I'm going to call it what we're moving away from. Uh, it's from uh, the Fitz in Michigan, uh, Eagle River, Michigan specifically. It's a, a Nashville chicken, hot chicken sandwich topped with mac and cheese. And then it has buttery Texas toast, which sounds hard to eat to me. And that was really kind of the theme of what we were doing. So we're moving away. Um, mashups are a lot of what we talk about here at Data Essential. They're essential in the food industry. Uh, and we're moving away from the extreme type of thing uh, into something a little bit more subtle. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about where we've been. Um, these are still perfectly good items. I would happily eat all of these for lunch after the webinar, uh, but we're moving away from these items where we were trying to push every single uh, favorite bestseller into one dish. Uh, why make someone decide between a soup bowl and pizza and chicken Alfredo when they can kind of have all of it in a very fun social media way um, or topping our burger with our beloved Bangkok shrimp? There's are still interesting ideas, but we would argue that we're moving away from that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I just wanted to so, highlight this chicken so farm. Just to go back, these are pre-COVID mashups we're looking yeah. at. And, and we think those were characterized by being sort of more extreme in your face types of items. Yeah. So this is all stuff that was happening just before COVID hit. Uh, it was the prior year. I looked for some fun mashups uh, that had pretty good scores in our scores database where we take our new items and limited time offers and we test them with consumers to see, you know, would you buy this? Do you think it's unique? Would you go somewhere just for it? And these were um, strong items on all of those aspects. And, and these are things that were fairly normal to see in the period leading up to COVID, these types of yeah. crazy combinations. Okay. Yeah. And we've mostly, I would say, um, we're kind of moving away from that. And I don't know how much of that is uh, everyone was working um, you know, at home and making mashups they never intended on doing with their sad uh, pantry that they had, or how much of it is that these so things are hard to can, move. Can I say, um, without you saying it. what this is, can anyone in chat guess what the heck this thing is on screen? I have no idea. Let's see, it's let's give them 30 here. seconds, Claire, and see if anyone guess, guesses. Everyone knows it's some type of lasagna. Nobody has uh, guessed the correct lasagna, but I don't know that that's the main point. It's a chicken parm lasagna. Uh, I saw that. Someone, someone guessed it, yeah. Oh, there yeah. they go. There, it's, it's coming. Um, some This one, I think, has it between the layers of noodles, though I've seen it where the actual cutlets are, in fact, the noodles. Um, but I'd say we're kind of moving away from that uh, into mashups that don't even seem like mashups anymore. Uh, buffalo chicken pizza, that's a, that's a close-up here of a buffalo chicken pizza. It's a mashup, technically speaking, but at this point that buffalo chicken flavor has become such a fabric of what we do that they're not even seen as mashups necessarily. It's simply a flavor. So we're moving to things that are a little bit more subtle, um, things that might be a bit more comforting as people come back to restaurants. Um, Did you find clear that the crazy extreme mashups leading up to COVID all tended to be on the more, let's say traditionally unhealthy side? of things or? 
Yes, it allowed you didn't have to decide which of the indulgent things you wanted. You could get all of them together. My favorite one um, was the classic Bloomin' Onion topped with ribs because those are two of my favorite indulgent there you things go. in one. That sounds um, But delicious. that was a little bit earlier. <laughs> Uh, so now we're seeing these. These are ones we've seen in the past year. I went a year back uh, into our database and you can see these aren't uh, near, they don't look nearly as strange. Um, you might not Instagram these, that wouldn't be the point. These are things that allow you to, some prior webinars that we've done had shown, you know, somehow despite eating tons of pizza during COVID, we're all still happy to eat more pizza. And yet uh, there's ways to make it interesting without getting too, um, too adventurous because people aren't ready to be adventurous necessarily on the en entree menu too much, or at least that's what our scores database is showing us. Uh, things that maybe would have seemed less adventurous a couple of years ago, or yeah, they would have seemed kind of standard at the time are now being perceived as more unique. I think it's a temporary point in time situation. I wouldn't say like, this is a time to stop thinking about innovation, but right now something like a taco pizza, if you call it street taco pizza is perceived as sort of a unique mashup, even though that all that's different here from our classic Tex-Mex taco pizza is that now we have salsa roja and there's lime wedges on the side. So, uh, that's so, not people, that were, uh, so people were sheltered at home for over a year eating a lot of food at home, which tends to be not nearly as interesting. We know that from our data extensively that people think restaurant food is much more craveable and appealing. That we didn't need the crazy extreme mashups in of yesteryear. You could do something a little more subtle, a little more reserved today, and it'll still be viewed as pretty unique. But that that is, as you said, just a moment in time as we start going back out to restaurants in the months ahead, our barometer for what's unique will probably change too and we'll need more unique stuff down the road. Yeah, that... so it gives us sort of an opportunity to think about formats, um, something that is maybe still approachable in that it's a close relative of something that we know. I, I practiced saying this one a million times, but it's a new word despite um, having some Spanish language background. So tele, teleuda. Um, so it's a giant tortilla, classic of the Oaxaca region. Um, that's basically a Mexican style pizza, like an actual authentic Mexican pizza. And this is one that you could easily do if it makes sense with your, I, I'm not saying, you know, every bar and grill should do this, but they certainly could if they explained it properly. And, you know, said like authentic Mexican style pizza from this region and explain themselves. It's Simply, as you can see, you know, big tortilla, um, refried beans, this one looks to be black beans, and then all those fresh veggies on top are really something that restaurants can do that's tedious for the home cook. So it lets them um, kind of have something that's very visually appealing, something that's not going to have traveled well. They wouldn't have had this probably over the past 19 months. And it gives that opportunity to introduce a new item while relating it back to the really classic pizza. That's well, amazing. And then we have another one. We've um, talked about this one in prior years too. This happens to be an image from Viva Vida La Pita in Ontario, Canada. I guess they're a chain there. Um, but this is their Manakish pizza as well as their shawarma pizza. And then uh, the Manakish is sort of interesting because uh, you know you could call it that, but I don't know that anyone would order it. Whereas if you add pizza to the end and explain that it's simply a flatbread, usually with minimal or no cheese, unless it's crumbled on top and ground beef and then a spice blend, that's going to be a lot more approachable. Um, someone in the comments noted, yes, it is as a tar spice blend. You can see the sesame seeds there. Um, so that's going to be more approachable. So they do call it a pizza in this case? They do. It is um, Manakish pizza and shawarma pizza on their menu. Yep. Uh, so that makes us think about how can we do these innovative new formats and uh, kind of keep them in approachable. If we think about platforms, uh, we've talked in again on prior webinars about how we're seeing sauces and flavors or dishes actually becoming sauces and flavors. And there's a couple good examples here. These are all um, not necessarily the best um, highest composite scores in our scores database, but rather the most unique items that still did pretty decently uh, across all measures uh, over the past year. And what we're seeing is uh, you very quickly notice these are all appetizers. And we've seen that time and time again, all of us uh, probably here listening in know I'm going to be more adventurous with my appetizers. And especially after a year, you know, over a year of not going to restaurants, I want that dish that I've been waiting to have in a restaurant as my entree. And I'm not changing my mind. Please don't put a strange spice or, or sauce on it right now. I'm not ready. 
but I am interested in sharing an interesting appetizer with my friends. It's possible we've not even been to a restaurant in a couple months, maybe longer. And I do want something that feels adventurous for that portion of my, my meal and having something as an option there. Um, all of these are actually, you know, variations on a fairly standard appetizer, but they seem more interesting. A corn dip is not exactly the most adventurous food item, but if I call it creamy elote dip, um, it even says with corn, um, you know, parentheses, duh, uh, to emphasize that it's, you know, it's not exactly that out there, uh, but it is a new flavor for us to try. Um, I like the roasted tikka cauliflower. This one actually did get pretty bold with herbs and spices, which we'll talk about in a bit here. That one has grains of paradise. And that's definitely a new flavor that you're not seeing a lot in our chain uh, database. That looks like a super high-end fine dining creative dish. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah, they did. It's a nice job, nice plating done there. Um, and then uh, we're also seeing uh, TJ Fridays is the classic, but moving um, into samplers are coming back. Uh, so our potato skins, uh, all of which surprise me, uh, sort of these things that you think of uh, as fairly standard, but there's ways to change the topping or uh, include a bunch of different people uh, by having different flavor elements. Now, whoever wants that classic dumpling isn't left out, but there's someone who can try something different if that's what they're into. Awesome. All right. So moving on, if we think about our um, platforms as you know, um, the way forward, uh, there's probably a happy medium. I said, don't put that weird sauce or that weird spice in there, though I think you can do it if you stick in the same family um, for the spices, which we'll show in a moment. So this one, uh, we were talking at the beginning of the webinar that I'm in the Portage Park, Irvin Park neighborhood of Chicago. This one's a block away from, a couple blocks from my house, uh, Aris uh, Brewery and Cider House. Uh, and this is their, um, their tofu sandwich. They're known for some of their vegetarian fare and they do a little bit more experimental stuff there. So it's a maple chipotle tofu sando. Um, it doesn't look like sando bread to me. This is not that nice, um, you know, white bread that you'd associate with Japanese cuisine, but it does have the tofu that's cooked in the crispy katsu style, which is, I think is why they feel like they can call it a sando. And then oddly, they mix it with a five spice powder, which is, you know, switching into a different cuisine type from that Japanese uh, end of things. So there's ways to integrate those spices while kind of nodding to new formats. And that is what we'll get into. So let's, uh, let's pivot real quickly if we can. So one of the things that Claire has been working on with the, some of the other parts of the team here are these things that we call inspiration reports. And there's a whole bunch of them in Report Pro for virtually every category of food or ingredient. And we thought we'd like to take you for just five minutes through what's, what you'll find in one of these. You'll find these to be really helpful for any innovation or inspiration projects that you have. It basically lays everything out for you and helps get those creative juices flowing. So Claire, can you run us through one of these real fast? Yeah, so we'll, we'll do that real fast here. Um, so we're going to go into herbs and spices. Uh, just because that is a, a format that we can use in a lot of different ways. So this is a screenshot from the actual platform. We've showed it a few times. So you could, let's pretend we're in here and we're uh, looking into herbs and spices and we're downloading it. Each inspiration report follows a, it's a very consistent framework. Uh, so the first thing that we do is we talk about the big trends and we set things up there. So the first thing that we have is from our menu trends database, uh, which is of course uh, functionally like a census of restaurants. And it lets us know what's the most common in that universe and how they've done over the past uh, one and four year. So quickly we see garlic is the top, uh, which isn't exactly surprising, but that's what how we do these reports. We set the stage, um, you know, you've got your top 10, usually a middle range one, and then the last ones that are, you know, the very lowest penetration coming up um, all the way down to 129, some spice blends. And tahini has cracked the top 50 now. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, I did, I did look broadly on this. Um, I, I think I might've done apps, entrees, sides last year. I wanted beverages in here. So beverages, uh, margaritas had a good year and that means tahini had a good year. Yeah. Um, so we see some growth uh, here. And I think what's important about these is you can see things like salt. You wouldn't think salt uh, is necessarily something growing. We've all been salting food tons, uh, certainly at restaurant, but calling it out with those finishing salts is where that growth is coming from. So we have the groundwork there. And then each uh, report has one of our menu adoption cycles in it. Uh, this particular one is uh, kind of a rite of passage for the menu adoption cycle team of looking at the herbs and spices and where they fall. For those a little less familiar on the call, uh, we have a framework here at Data Central where 
food trends follow from inception to adoption to pro proliferation and ubiquity. Uh, inception is going to be, uh, you know, global market specific, fine dining specific. In the land of spices, it's going to be stuff you have to order special online because you cannot find it even at the specialty spice store. And then adoption is going to be, it just says trendy restaurants. That's typically your fast casual restaurants and then your casual dining independence. And proliferation is where we get quick service and casual dining chains. And then ubiquity is of course found everywhere. So in this case, in the land of spices, that's gonna be if you get that um, sad spice rack from you know, the coals that has like 10 year old spices in it, those are probably all included in, in ubiquity. And then here we have, uh, this This is like, if I could pick one slide from the inspiration reports to share, this would be the one, uh, because we look at what's happening across all of the data that we have, and we pick these mega trends and then place them on that, that menu adoption cycle. So this is what the, the group, um, they're, they're written by me. This is what I think you need to know about spices. Um, so in this case, it's pulling together um, not necessarily just numbers, but also thinking about what we're seeing at retail, what we've um, seen happening in industry publications, and these are the essential ones. Uh, you'll notice for something like spices, which tend to be a bit more trend forward, most of the trends are falling to adoption uh, rather than necessarily uh, later stages because they are what tends to be the forefront of innovation. And to the right hand side, you see lots of those kind of very trendy chili flakes, um, starting to see that challenge of, you know, the sourcing challenges of Aleppo pepper, and now it's being called Naresh, which is the same pepper, but the naming convention and sourcing differ slightly. And this is the other fun part. Each of those mega trends um, for a handful, it's not all of them, not yet at least, uh, we're going to go into actual restaurant examples, pretty pictures, and talk about how to apply these things. So in this case, um, we're having something like hibiscus. Uh, we're talking about how to use it as a format. Uh, hibiscus, you think of more as a flavor, but in this case, in the bottom right-hand corner, we have it actually as a hibiscus corn tortilla. So it becomes that format and it becomes that um, kind of that nice color that we can see. Uh, same idea, um, thinking of a theme, I mentioned um, we don't want to change our spices necessarily on an entree, but if you explain that it's similar or you have something that's familiar, so you could do a new warming spice, you could have cinnamon, nutmeg, and now also coriander or cardamom. Uh, that's another theme that we're seeing here, um, and these are some pretty pictures for that. Uh, and then we also think very broadly, it's not necessarily in these inspiration reports what you might have thought of previously of what something should be. So not everyone thinks of seeds as a flavor, but certainly most spices are seeds that are ground down. So you could certainly think of it that way. And that's one theme that we saw in the data is the growth of the, the seed form themselves rather than the ground uh, down version. So we highlighted that here. So, you know, a fennel crust that's actually using the fennel seeds is um, what's happening to this fried chicken sandwich with fennel brine, so actually taking that pickling liquid um, with that flavor of fennel, instead of having dill, you're going to do fennel. Um, that's a way to kind of make that format just a little bit different. How big is that pork chop in that lower right? It's a double cut. It, this is one of my agendas, Jack, a double cut pork chop, so it's gigantic. <laughs> Holy crap, that thing is huge. Okay. Um, and then for the each uh, inspiration report does look at regionality uh, and those are by the four main census regions uh, and that's not necessarily the most menu thing it's what's most unique to that region. So here in the Midwest, uh, one of our most unique seasonings is of course celery salt uh, driven by Chicago style hot dogs. Uh, so that's um, another highlight to these. Uh, they can uh, I really like these pages. Often there's um, flavors or uh, dishes that I don't actually see in the rest of the data. So there's call outs, for example, in the South to tobacco, which tends to be cocktail driven. Um, you're not gonna see that if you don't look at the regional specific view. Um, just a pretty picture to show how, you know, sage doesn't necessarily feel like something that would make sense at a Chinese restaurant or in a dumpling application, but there are ways to take these flavors and kind of tie them in with different cuisines. And the last part uh, that we have is we look uh, more at the ubiquity area of things. Um, we look at the limited time offers and look at those later stage trends to tie them to items that are limited time offers. 
And lastly, because we would do ourselves a disservice if we didn't think about retail, uh, we have a Get Inspired section, which looks at secondary research and uh, different things from retail. So this one notes uh, my beloved raw spice bar, which I was probably too early of an adopter. Uh, this part of the inspiration report is often where subscriptions show up. Uh, in this case, it's you get five or so uh, spices, freshly ground, fancy sourced, et cetera, and they come with recipes so that you can learn how to use them um, in a new way. And lastly, um, we will bring in, if it's something that's hard to find pictures of on a menu, it's not happening in a menu universe, but we think it's important for our clients to know about, we'll put it here and try to come up with a retail theme. So in this case, sourcing was one of the inception trends. It's really expensive to source nice um, herbs and spices. So we aren't seeing it as much yet at major chains, of course, uh, or necessarily at um, more mainstream retail. We do think it's an important thing to note. So we brought in some of those smaller, um, just direct to consumer, types of businesses like Burlap and Barrel who are known for their equitably sourced single origin spices. And in the end, we did tie it back to values by talking about sourcing as our last thing. And that's, Thank you, Claire. That's if we could uh, go forward one more slide. Just a reminder, what Claire just showed you is just one of the dozens of inspiration reports that are already inside Report Pro with new ones being added every single week. So if you have an innovation project, you need to do something on pizza, or burgers or breakfast sandwiches, you name it, uh, you'll have a great head start with that inspiration report. Um, I wanted to say thanks again. I think we're actually gonna finish just about on time. We can go uh, one more slide forward, Claire. Uh, whoop, let's go back. Uh, we'll be back at this in two weeks. It's amazing. We're about to enter October already and we'll be joined by one of our favorite people in the world and uh, someone that I consider perhaps the most interesting person in the world of food, Dr. Paul Rosen, uh, who is a food psychologist and will share some really interesting perspectives on how food shapes culture and vice versa. So uh, we'll see in two weeks. If you aren't doing business with Data Central already, you can email us uh, hello at datacentral.com. Uh, and if you're interested in Report Pro and you didn't get a chance to vote yes, earlier and you'd like to learn a little bit more now in chat just uh write the word yes hit enter and uh we'll get you some more information on that as well so uh just type in yes and we'll let this run for maybe another minute or so uh but thank you uh, it's uh this has been a lot of fun